Hello, my fellow Shibes and crypto enthusiasts. This is Hiroja Shibe, back again, starting the uh, Musings of the Shibe podcast to reflect upon some of the things that have happened in the past year since I've um, stopped doing the podcast, but pushing on forward to the new and exciting things that are happening um, within the cryptocurrency world. So join me as we cover news, events, people, companies, things that are happening within the cryptocurrency space as I inform you what's going on and, and expose some of my opinions on some of the activities and events that are occurring. So <clears throat> let us begin with some news. So some v- Venezuelan Bitcoin miners were arrested for quote-unquote electric theft. What has been happening in Venezuela is uh, their economy is in shambles. Um, their pa- their paper money is worthless. Uh, there's literally no food within the country. People are digging into trash, going to the black markets. People aren't getting paid. Violence has gone up. Um, everyone from uh, the private sector to the public sector is, a lot of things are in disarray. And one of the avenues that uh, the people in Venezuela have done is some have turned to Bitcoin. And what Bitcoin has enabled them to do, not only to uh, transfer wealth and maybe purchase um, goods and items, is they will buy stuff from places like Cuba or Brazil uh, across the border um, and ship uh, food and necessities, purchase it with Bitcoin, and then smuggle it into Venezuela to either for themselves or their family or to sell it out in the black market. Another avenue that uh, Venezuelans are doing to try to create wealth is mine Bitcoin. Uh, Because Venezuela is a socialist system, um, all the electricity is free. So just like back in the day when people were using their university dorm rooms or if they had an apartment or they had some access to uh, free electricity, they would uh, fire up these miners to mine Bitcoin. And this was a a great means for them to be able to, again, generate wealth. They were developing their own um, mining companies, um, mining platforms, and just basically enabling them to be able to be successful in basically surviving and living, really. But Venezuelan, the Venezuelan government has cracked down on this. And not only have they arrested these miners, but they also shut down one of the biggest um, Bitcoin exchanges on um, in Venezuela. A company um, escapes right now, but I'll look for it in a second after I read this article, that has been around for, I want to say, about three years. And... What has happened is that people have just gone to local Bitcoin and are going to peer to peer to obtain their Bitcoin. But it's a it's a strong use case of how uh, Bitcoin is a hedge against um, government money. It's also a strong use case of how people in general are using decentralized and peer to peer systems to live and sustain themselves. But let me read a little bit from this article from Bitcoin.com, and then we'll talk about it for just a sec. So, four Venezuelans were arrested for stealing power to mine Bitcoin. Uh, this is the name of the article. Uh, it was written by Jer- Jamie Redmond. In the early morning of January 25th, Venezuela director of the, the Corps of Scientific, Penal, and Criminal Investigative Investigations. Wow, I didn't realize that science had a criminal investigation unit. Revealed the arrest of four individuals involved in Bitcoin mining. According to the report, Alberto Jose Zapata Orta, uh, Anand Cecilia Francis Venezuela, Nestor Rafael Armando Priscilla, and Kevin David Oja Diaz were in custody for alleged electoral threat. The accused miners' uh, Instagram account showed the group had roughly 300 miners from brands like uh, Spoon Doodles and Ant Miners. The new outlet details that the mining operation was found in a town close to the border where foreign currencies are often traded. The report also explained the accused will face charges of cyber fraud and for stealing electricity. Uh, Cryptotonus says that they have been other reports of this type of activity in the country and they have yet to be confirmed. Previously, similar cases have been reported in Venezuela, although some have not been officially confirmed, explains the Spanish language Bitcoin publication. The tense political and economic situation in the country has led to the adoption of the cryptocurrency in this country. Since Bitcoin offers many freedoms that Venezuelans cannot enjoy in an overly controlled economy and clear recession. Venezuela isn't the only country where people are getting in trouble for 
electricity theft. The past September, two Dutch brothers from Rotterdam, the Netherlands, were arrested for stealing electricity to mine bitcoins. The region's open bar minstrel detailed authorities had confiscated 200 euros in the bitcoin mining equipment. Additionally, there have been reports the past summer from China where people were accused of stealing power to run cryptocurrency mining operations. The Chinese publication Weibo reported that Mashin police took down three facilities and a large quantity of mining devices. Other Chinese news outlets have reported similar findings of so-called Bitcoin electric bandits this past December. In a recent arrest in Venezuela, authorities believe money laundering may have been involved. However, uh, crypto goddess explained average citizens are using Bitcoin to purchase necessities that are not readily available in the country. Everyday items such as cornmeal, milk, baby baby diapers, butter, soap, detergent, antiperspirant, and toothpaste are purchased with the cryptocurrency. The report further details Bitcoin's buying power in stating, not to mention the medicines for treatments for multiple diseases, which are not available in the country's dispensaries, something that has raised international alarms and has caused many people to talk about a humanitarian crisis and process. The new outlet suggests it's not the first time Venezuela's socialist government has persecuted individuals for using their own wealth, nor will it be at the last. My big issue um, overall with this, besides the fact that these people are being arrested by um, the Venezuelan government, is... The, the cryptocurrency as a whole had been encouraging it, um, even selling the miners, uh, talking about it, praising these people for um, doing this activity in Venezuela to circumvent, circumvent their government. But now that these people have been arrested, I haven't seen anywhere as far as Western publications for calls to pay for these guys' lawyers, to get them bailed out, to make sure they're taken care of. It seems that when people speak about revolution or they talk about circumventing government and uh, rah rah that type of you know espouse that type of ideology, but when it comes to putting your body on the line or when it comes to you know putting your you know just standing up and doing something that is right, there's no one to be found, and it looks like these um, these individuals um, are going to be facing a very serious time in a government that's known to not have the best prison system. Period, and it's. It's just extremely, extremely sad. I'm going to follow up more on this. I think, personally, um, I'm trying to find as much information as I can to see if I can try to galvanize um, the community to try to do these things, to try to make sure they have a lawyer, to make sure that they have representation, to make sure that they're protected, that they're taken care of, that they're not um, tossed in general population or even face an actual time period. I think... This is a significant missed opportunity on the part of the community that they, this has not already happened. And we're now in the month of February, and I haven't seen any kind of calls of that nature happening. Then again, this could be something happening behind the scenes, and people are not discussing it because Venezuela and the government might, you know, try to shut it down. But I'm looking very heavily into this. So the name of the exchange that shut down was um, Shibuta Coin. Shibu Shibu Sure, Bitcoin. Um, this article comes from um, Bitcoinus. Venezuela shuts down Bitcoin exchange and arrests more miners. So Venezuela's largest Bitcoin exchange, uh, Sir, Sir Bitcoin, is no longer uh, trading locally after its bank suddenly suspended withdrawals and deposit services. In a statement Thursday, the exchange said it would be forced to cease operation for at least two weeks while it establishes a new business structure, new improvements and security measures. Users had only one day to withdraw funds. Um, the February 3rd deadline had been already passed, and any capital still held faces an uncertain future. It's reported that with the two-week offline period was not guaranteed. We hope the situation is restored and begin to process your withdrawal, says Sabuto wrote on his Facebook page. The exchange has its physical presence in the U.S., but has faced a raft of problems with its Venezuelan bank, uh, Basasco, in recent times. Local news resources... Adaro Bitcoin reports that delayed payments and holdups due to problematic banking infrastructure means that this total sufficient comes at a less of a surprise. Uh, Venezuela is currently a tense area for Bitcoin users. Last month, four people were arrested for running a Bitcoin mining operation, what officials said was undermining the country's electro electrical grid. The setup, which involved, um, we already reported about this, but there was also another more impressive operation, and I would assume. It was probably an operation that um, was the biggest, if not the biggest, um, Bitcoin mining, mining operation in Venezuela. Uh, the day before, on February 2nd, Venezuelan authorities detained uh, four men suspected of, of a Bitcoin mining, 
mining, mining forcing the country's main exchange platform to temporarily shut down Operation Lewis's bank account. On February 2nd, authorities confiscated 11,000 computers belonging to Bitcoin miners. Mining is the process of, okay, we already know what that is. Espanio Gomez, 51, and Andres Alonjo Carrera Martinez, 35, were both arrested for cybercrime, financial terrorism, electrical theft, and fraud. What caused the reaction was the fact that 11,000 mining computers were consuming the same amount of energy that a whole city uses it at the time of scarcity, which I don't think that is really the case, but they're just, they're just trying to get these people. In an isolated case, Adam Eric uh, Taposasa and Edward Antonio Taposasa were detained in Caracas for mining cryptocurrency, according to the authorities. The Taposasa brothers were tracked through their online marketing site, Miradora Li Libera, and their equipment valued at U the U.S. $334 million was also seized. So two pretty huge Bitcoin operations have been shut down within the country in this crackdown to um, stop the transfer of wealth between citizens that is not controlled by the government. In other news, some little bit of Mt. Gox news, and we'll, we'll do an update on Mt. Gox. We're going to do an update on Mt. Gox and the Silk Road because... In the years since I've uh, stopped podcasting, there has been some, actually some movement. Not so much on the Mt. Gox, but definitely on Silk Road. So this comes from Bitcoin.com and is written by Kevin Helms. Hedge funds are buying Mt. Gox Bitcoin claims. Uh, Mt. Gox creditors have waited for over three years to see if some of the lost Bitcoin return, but the end is still not in sight. However, a number of them may be able to cash out soon since some hedge funds are now buying Mt. Gox claims offering 15% of the claims value in cash. A website called My Gox Claims has been created by some Mt. Gox creditors to connect claimants with interested buyers. According to the Financial Times, Daniel Clem, an attorney representing creditors' interest in the case, and, at, and a Mt. Gox creditor himself, is one of the people responsible for setting up this site. So, I guess if you are looking or seeking to recruit something because you don't believe you're going to get anything back, then this might be an option for you. But I think eventually, if any money or any Bitcoins is somehow recovered, this is a boon for these um, particular investors, if you will, because with Bitcoin trading at a thousand and going climbing above that a thousand right now, as far as um, as of February twentieth, there could be a significantly potential boom. I mean, I've heard people losing up to like a thousand Bitcoin to, you know, a couple Bitcoins to a hundred to even up to ten thousand Bitcoin. Just imagine what, you know, the potential uh, payout could be if any of this Bitcoin is recovered. And what is missing is 850,000 Bitcoins are missing. And some of that has gone back into, you might say, the uh, marketplace. But a, a chunk of it is sitting in these, uh, what has been tracked down is a lot of these Bitcoin wallets and hasn't moved. So there's, I would say, probably around... Oh, 700,000. That's just an estimate, my estimation. That's not out in the market. Uh, slushing around, whether being bought, sold, or traded, or uh, used, or spent. On, so that's 700,000 on top of the million that Satoshi has. Plus, some of the Silk Road, not all the Silk Road has been recovered. There's still a chunk of that. So there's... Between those two big things, with uh, Satoshi Nakamoto having a million Bitcoin, between the Mt. Goss and Silk Road, this combination, and if you would take all the other hacks and stuff like that, I would assume that there's probably up to mm, 2 million Bitcoin that is not going to ever potentially be out there. Not to mention, I would love to see the potential number of just lost Bitcoin. People lost their private keys and so it's just sitting out there on the blockchain. Um, mind you, there's only 21 million Bitcoin ever. So potentially there's really just mm, 19 million Bitcoin, just to make the math simple, that anyone can ever truly access eventually. That's a significant chunk that's not on the marketplace. And eventually as uh, Bitcoin becomes more mass adopted as um, I think we're at 15 million I think of Bitcoin mined as more and more that number gets higher and higher that's going to really matter and it's going to increase the scarcity 
because really what it's going to be is not going to be 21 million Bitcoin. It's going to be really, let's say, due to loss and theft and sitting just on the blockchain and not moving or whatever. There's really just only 18 million Bitcoin that's going to be potentially traded around and spent off of. And I, it will, again, increase its scarcity and increase its value. So if you do have a claim for Mt. Gox, maybe this might be something that you might be interested in. Uh, some little just uh, internet news. Uh, Arrested tech technician, in an article written by Joe Barton. When a city has a gigabyte internet, prices for slower speeds drop. Even cu customers who don't buy a gigabyte plans may benefit from lower prices. This is how the market works. The mere presence of a gigabyte internet speeds in a metro area drives down the price of plans with slower speeds, according to the new industry funded research. Thus, the data suggests that even customers who don't purchase gigabyte internet benefit from its availability. The research also found that, to no one's surprise, that having more ISPs in a particular region drives prices down, and the presence of fast speeds encourages other ISPs to offer higher speed plans to match their competitors. This is why, you know, the cable companies were attacking Google Fiber, um, because it's it drove down prices. When a city went Google Fiber, they're not going to buy Comcast or um, I guess now it's Spectrum's out there. They're not going to pay for those plans. Not only that, but this is also a reason why ISPs are trying to stop um, cities from creating their own uh, internet infrastructure either via wireless or um, the traditional means of laying down their own fiber and creating their own network so that their city residents can have you know, the best um, and cheapest uh, inter internet plan out there to have that complete and full access. So this is very important. I'll be curious to see if in the wide spectrum when we start talking about because there, there's so many parts even in the, in the states that don't have access to the internet because of infrastructure issues. What the workaround will be, like for example, I'm thinking in a city like Las Vegas um, has giga plans going around through it and it has a few different types of um, competition. It has Cox Cable, it has Verizon, AT&T, not to mention satellite. Um, I'm sure Google's in there somewhere. Um, I wonder what it would do for the outlying areas like uh, Totopah or other cities in the, in the, in the um, rural areas if they benefit from having a war, um, their, their particular internet plans um, going down to simply by the sheer presence of the other of the IC, ISPs. Even though they're not in their area, I would imagine those plans in those rural areas would also probably go down too and it probably would help increase adoption in those areas. It might increase adoption just for the simple fact that if AT&T and all these companies can't make money in the cities, they might have to go out in the rural areas to try to recruit some kind of investment um, gains, if you will. But we'll see. We'll see what happens, whether or not um, the ability to uh, increase the expand of wireless out into rural areas as a means of internet traffic is going to beat any type of ambitions that maybe might happen with um, cable companies going to rural places. So this is a summary of the findings, and this is kind of a significant drop. Uh, the presence of a gigabyte service in a market associated with a $27 decrease in the average monthly price of a broadband plans with speed of 100 megabytes or greater, but less than 100 gigabytes. That's a 25% reduction. Markets with gigabyte internet also see smaller price decreases for plans as low as 25 megabytes. The presence of a gigabyte internet had no significant effect on prices of plans with speeds below 25 megabytes. This is a surprise since the slowest plans are already the cheapest and are uh, suitable substitutes for giga speeds. Giga prices decline when at least two providers offer gigabyte services. If a DMA moves from having one to two providers of a gigabyte internet, we estimate that the standard monthly price for a gigabyte internet will, will decline by approximately to $57 to $62, which is equal to a reduction of the price between 34 and 37 percent, the study said. Going from one to three gigabyte competition will reduce prices by estimated to $98.11 to $106.50 per month. Competition at any speeds reduce prices. An increase of one competitor associated with approximately a $1.50 decline in monthly standard broadband prices for internet plans with speeds ranging from 50, uh, mega, uh, 50 MP, MP, 
50 M PBSs to less than 1 gig gigaps. The study said for plans with download speeds of less than 25 M PBSs, the, the decrease is the decrease in average monthly price is to 42 cents for each competitor. And then it just kind of goes on. Um, all these news stories will be um, linked in the show notes. And as you know, cryptocurrencies become more widely adapt adopted by both institutions and individuals and peoples. And as countries are beginning to address it, address the issue of cryptocurrency within their, either the legislative order by either having an on-hands approach or off-hands approach or crafting uh, legislation to address uh, the nature of cryptocurrency as far as taxes go, because it always comes down to taxes, you, you still get the scare tactics still happening. So the WGBC focuses on the misuse of digital currencies by criminals and terror terrorist financiers. This is by Brave New Coin, uh, written by Luke Park. The Interpol, Europol, and the Basel Institute of Governance recently held a conference in Doha, Qatar, the Global Conference on Counterfeiting, on Countering Money Laundering and Digital Currencies attracted over 400 financial investors for financial intelligence units around the world. The primary purpose of the conference was to give law enforcement agencies, the private sector, the tools and trainings to detect and fight the criminal use of digital currencies. The three-day event included a range of presentations, mostly from the private spe privacy sector speeches. I cannot speak today. Private sector speakers, including several researchers, uh, entrepreneurs, and criminal investigators, and prosecutors with experience in cybercrime enforcement. Well, that was not a well-constructed sentence. Uh, the conference was organized by the Working Group on Virtual Currencies, a joint initiative formed in September 2016 by Interpol, Europol, and the Basel Institute on Governance. While Interpol is also a member of the Commonwealth Virtual Currency Working Group, the WGVC is a global effort funded by the authorities of Qatar. So a lot of different people are forming, like Voltron, to, to address the digital currency space and to kind of quash it or demonize it, much like they've done successfully in the public mind when it comes to Tor. So it's a, these are names and joint ventures that we need to have a lookout for, particularly, especially when they start putting out presentations or news um, stories. You need to look out for the working group of virtual currencies as well as the Commonwealth Virtual Currency, virtual currency Work Group and just debunk, chastise, or counter what they're doing. And that is it for the news. So Hal Finney is a preemptive um, cryptographer. He is one of the earlier cypherpunk um, guys. He has helped develop the uh, PGP protocol. Uh, he worked for the PGT Pro uh, Corporation, but uh, he's probably more famously known for being one of the first people to receive a Bitcoin transaction from Sh Shitoshi Nakamoto himself. In fact, they had corresponded with one another um, quite frequently about the development of the protocol and it's believed that Hal Feeney and another gentleman named uh, Nick uh, Zabo are responsible for a lot of the early uh, legwork or co code work to get the uh, Bitcoin protocol working um, properly. There was a lot of uh, early bugs and soft forks and hard forks early on in the development of Bitcoin and Hal Finney was one of the uh, earliest people that was not only part of the development but um, the usage of Bitcoin. Unfortunately, he passed away from ALS in 2015, I believe. And uh, since his passing, um, there's a lot of remembrance of him. But most importantly, he was also targeted to, by trolls. In particular, what happened is actually, he died in 2014. I'm sorry, August 28th, 2014. You know, he was subject to that whole um, troll tactic that was the thing that trolls were doing at the time, which was swatting. They were stating that if he, they, he, they didn't receive a thousand Bitcoin from him, they were going to swat him. And his home was swatted several different times. Um, a really um, horrific and tragic thing if you think about it. A person who has ALS and SWAT is coming to your home. Um, but uh, anyways, the reason why we're, we're talking about Hal Finney is that 
his Bitcoin talk forum, um, his account had, his password had changed. Uh, this is from Merkle.com. How Finney's Bitcoin Talk account password changed after four years of inactivity. If you're unfamiliar with Bitcoin Talk, it's one of the three destinations for information. Um, for, you know, it is the premier place. It's like Bitcoin Talk, our Bitcoin, and um, Bitcoin.com are like the three places that people go to to gain information about Bitcoin. And what had happened was that Bitcoin uh, Talk their account had been hacked, all the passwords have been out there on the dark web. Uh, so obviously someone was able to guess Alfini's password and changed it. Now this was known was um, using the Bitcoin Talk account trust, one could see if account's password has recently changed. Howell's account shows the following message. The user's password was reset recently. Furthermore, taking a look at Howell's profile, you can see the account was last active today, which was um, February 12th. Uh, the account's last post was 2013, so it's quite puzzling as to why it was recently active. The guy's also been dead for almost three years. One possible estimation is that a hacker has cra cracked his account password. Bitcoin Talk was hacked last year, and all its users' data, including hash passwords, surfaced for sale on the dark net. Many Bitcoin Talk accounts have been compromised, and hash passwords were cracked, especially those who didn't bother to change their password after the hack, which was made very public. It comes to no surprise that Howell didn't change his password between 2013 and 2016, so it's entirely possible that hacker was able to gain access to his account. Howell was the second most important person after Satoshi, so we believe that he was Satoshi himself. Hopefully the recent account activity is just a misunderstanding and another, not another, another malicious attack. And this recent change, this recent little messing with how Feedy's account, uh, kind of goes back to... Um, was on Bitcoin.com, which is put up by Roger Ver, which is uh, these popular bounties. Satoshi Halfini and Roger Ver hacker. Help catch a hacker that hacked into Satoshi Nakamoto's and Roger Ver's uh, email accounts. Bounty award is uh, 37.6875 Bitcoin, which is now 44,000 K dollars. There's also other bounties. Uh, help catch the person responsible for the missing 600 K BTC from Mt. Gox. Other uh, shell reports is even much higher, around 7K, uh, 700K, if you will. That's 2.129. That's only um, less than 3,000. Extortionist bounty default for fully improving identity of extortionist and bounty award. That's 20, 20 uh, Bitcoin bounty. So a little bit over um, 20K in U.S. currency. And, you know, this has happened before. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto's account has been compromise on a couple of different places, both Bitcoin.com and his popular email. He, of course, famously disappeared in 2013. So, you know, who knows, you know, who he is or what's going to happen here or what other accounts might have been compromised. It's just a little sad that one of the prominent um, Bitcoin advocates and developers, you know, after his passing, people are still messing with him. So this is a little side note about Bitcoin. So one of the biggest, I would say three of the biggest things that have happened since um, I stopped podcasting is one, there hasn't been any meaningful, meaningful, really true movement addressing the uh, Bitcoin uh, block issue. Yes, I know about SegWit and Lightning Network and uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, but these are things that were proposed way back in not only 2014, 13, and 15 when I uh, stopped uh, podcasting towards the end of 2015. And nothing has progressed all through 2016, really. Only things kind of gotten worse. Yes, uh, SigWit and Bitcoin Unlimited have been activated. And different mining pools are activating di the different protocols. And I guess we'll eventually uh, get into the difference between the two and the breakdown. But there's a bit of a stalemate or stagnation if you will on that particular issue the other thing is that privacy is becoming more and more the cry of people they want privacy on the usage of bitcoin because after all bitcoin does in fact have the highest value of the cryptocurrencies it is after all the first uh, it has the strongest network is more widely distributed more people value it use it of course there's max maximalists out there that think it should be only just bitcoin and Everything else is basically a scam. That is not the case. 
as a result of the void of not addressing or having privacy be something that is part of the Bitcoin protocol or even adopted in the Bitcoin protocol, other cryptocurrencies have sought to fill that, that market void, if you will. Uh, there's Dash, there's Zcash, Zcoin, Shadowcash, and Monero are the probably the big five with who knows what else is being developed as we speak uh, to address the privacy issue. At the same time, um, tumblers are becoming more sophisticated, uh, more widely used. Uh, tumblers, of course, are mixing uh, protocols that mix your Bitcoin transactions with other people who are uh, making a transaction that have the same amount. So if you're spending uh, 0.5 Bitcoin, you would have to mix with a person who has um, who's also uh, spending 0.5 in Bitcoin and sort of uh, hiding your transactions, if you will, through the blockchain without it coming back to your to your various addresses, if you will, uh, making it more difficult to trace through the through the blockchain. Because after all, there's um, blockchain spies. Uh, Coinbase is notorious for this. There are nodes that actually blacklist uh, certain Bitcoin transactions. They won't process it or put it on the blockchain. For the simple fact because you utilize those Bitcoin on um, drug web market websites or it's associated with some kind of nefarious activity that the person who runs the node does not want to uh, acknowledge um, that transaction. Uh, so you have that. So you have uh, the lack of movement on the issue of the increasing the block size. Uh, second is development of these privacy cache things. And three is just really, um, you know, they have their tumblers. You have hard wallets and soft wallets, uh, which we will get into some of the improvements that have happened in those areas. But the with tumblers, hard wallets, and soft wallet, uh, not soft, software wallets, seeking to address the privacy issue and helping uh, individuals being able to be a little bit more private, if you will, with their, their use of... Um, Bitcoin, having that uh, a sophisticated um, protocol, if you will, embedded within the Bitcoin wallet so that you won't know what's really going on, really. And one of those wallets seeking to do that, and we'll talk about Samurai Wallet when we talk about software wallets, because there's even some issues with Samurai, Samurai Wallet, just exactly how private it really is. But one of the things they have come up with is payment codes. So this comes from Bitcoin.com. Bitcoin Privacy Enhanced Reusable Payment Codes Just Got More Useful by Kevin Helms. Reusable payment codes, which can be used in place of Bitcoin addresses to give transactions more privacy, just got more useful. Now there's a directory for payment codes, a beta launch last week by the Samurai Wallet developers. What is a payment code? The invention that highly private Bitcoin payment codes for hierarchical de deterministic HD wallet stays back to 2015, when Bitcoin developer and engineer uh, Justice Ramnier wrote Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 47, or BIP 47, to define the technique for creating payment codes according to his definition, payment codes are a technique for creating permanent Bitcoin addresses that can be reused and publicly associated with a real-life identity without creating a loss of financial privacy. They are similar to stealth addresses but involve a different set of trade-offs and features that may make them more practical. Uh, stealth addresses is another thing that we'll get into as well when we just talk about the overall privacy issue. Um, when we talked about getting into the in deep in depth detail about privacy cash. Last year, Samurai Wallet became the first to create a full BIP uh, 47 implementation of payment codes designed to bring privacy to public payments. Payment codes are longer than Bitcoin addresses and it can only be generated in the wallets that are BIP. 47 ready, and so far they only include Samurai Wallet. But sending and receiving parties need the Android only Samurai Wallet to use the feature. When sending the Bitcoin using a payment code, a payment channel will be created between both wallets by sending a special transaction on the blockchain called a broadcast transaction, require, requires one network confirmation to confirm. And Samurai Web, website explains here are the instructions and how to set up the payment code. Another little thing too um, with transactions as well as it goes back to the whole uh, Bitcoin um, block size debate is that uh, transactions are taking longer transaction fees are in fact getting higher uh, the first time ever in my usage of Bitcoin I've actually had a 
transaction drop that is actually possible where after 24 hours if there's zero confirmation so your transaction will be dropped and your you basically doesn't go through it and your bitcoin or your money's back in your wallet that um i have been using bitcoin since 2013 that has never happened to me before um but it's happening more and more often which is an issue so it would be interesting to see how that is addressed as far as um, the protocol goes with it, the confirmation um, between these two Samurai wallets. Um, Samurai wallet itself also is in beta when it's on the Android. I looked it up and it's only in beta right now. So last week the startup announced a beta launch of the payment code. This whole thing is on is in beta. A searchable public directory of reasonable payment codes. The directory allows anyone to sign up with just an email address and all Bitcoin users in the future can add their payment codes to the directory associated with their chosen information such as their name, social media accounts, and a picture. Using the directory, anyone's payment code can be looked up by name, social username, or email address. From there, the Bitcoin can be sent directly to anyone by scanning the QR code on the page. No address will be shared or reused and there's no way to track the transaction. Once other wallets have included BIP47 uh, payment codes, the users can also add their codes to the directory, making it a central directory for everyone's payment codes, which could be a bit of an issue, but we'll see how this experiment goes. Um, there's a little bit more to go on with as well. So here's a little bit how this could potentially be a problem, but not a problem. So why use payment codes? Posting a Bitcoin public address online, such as on forums or social media pages, is far more private since the world can track payment history associated with address on the blockchain. The payment code can be publicly associated with identity without giving anyone the ability to track its transactions on the blockchain. They have created to be a Bitcoin address alternative that can be posted publicly in mass with none of the privacy concerns that Bitcoin users now face. Bitcoin sent to the payment code can get directed to a unique Bitcoin address every time. The recipient will be able to see the payment code of the sender and can send Bitcoins back to them as easily as replying to the email. Revenue are explained to Bitcoin.com. Payment codes are therefore great for mass advertising and accepting payments privately, he noted. So, basically what it is, is you're giving a buffer to your Bitcoin address. And I can see potentially how that will prevent any type of um, direct privacy issues. My personal concern is what happens when something happens to that payment code. I mean, is it going to be like a, a wallet where if you lose that payment code and someone knows all the transaction histories associated with that payment code? Um, like I said, it just came out, so we'll see how it goes and how it's developed. Um, some more Samurai Wallet news. And we'll eventually do an entire episode kind of updating what has happened in the wallet space, both on the hard drive as well as the uh, software applications, both on the desktop and mobile devices. But... Samurai Wallet launches new privacy feature, feature um, Ricochet. Uh, Samurai unveils a premium, premium Bitcoin transaction hop service. Launched in the spring of 2015, the creators of the Samurai Bitcoin Wallet have been staunch advocates of Bitcoin privacy and fungibility. The Android-based wallet uses military-grade AS-256 encryption and keeps private keys in the hands of the owner. The team recently revealed uh, Ricochet, which is a feature that adds four additional hops to a transaction. The Samurai team explains that a thousand, thousands of transactions are flagged and blacklisted by uh, blockchain spies on a daily basis. Bitcoin banks and exchanges freeze funds and suspend users based on the blacklist published by blockchain spies, explains the Samurai developers. Blockchain spies look at the history of your coins around 5 hop C. Your coins can be frozen for their past activity, even if they weren't in your control. Ricochet adds for additional, 4 additional hops to the transaction by adding an additional hop before the coin reaches their final destination. The big blockchain spies would need to look 10 hops backwards and increase their costs and overheads. So, for example, this has happened quite a bit with a lot of people where they may um, receive a Bitcoin somehow, but the origins of the Bitcoin might have been, you know, it could have been Silk Road. Someone used it on Silk Road, and then that person who received that uh, Bitcoin then went and spent it somewhere else or, or sold it on exchange. And so when you go through the entire transaction history, uh, all it's going to come up with is, for example, it was on Silk Road, it was a drug transaction, or it was used on a porn site, or it was used on this site or that site that gets flagged, 
And even though you did not personally do those type of transactions, your Bitcoin could be associated with that. And thus, you can have your entire accounts be um, taken down. This has happened with Coinbase, where there's been users who purchase a Bitcoin on Coinbase and then turn around and uh, purchase something that might be considered illicit, if you will, and they've had their account uh, shut down because Coinbase traces your uh, Bitcoin transactions um, after you've you purchased it, which is a kind of a scary thing in and of itself. So a new way to monetize a wallet project. Many have wondered in the past how a wallet company can sustain itself offering a free service. One Reddit user commented during an announcement saying, interesting feature and one way that, that a small wallet team can monetize a wallet without resorting to an IOC scam. I think this is the type of revenue model that wallet, de wallet devs should pursue. The Samurai developers say that exactly what they aim to accomplish rather than to monetize by pushing users towards the arms of Know Your Customer merchants. Some commentators said they didn't appreciate the bold characterization of wallet developers who abide by overreaching KY policies. Samurai explains that they have nothing personal against those programs monetizing in this fashion. It's just something on which the team will never compromise. We don't see any KY-related re functionality as useful, de detail Samurai developers. Those who degree, disagree have plenty of options to choose from. As for, as for revenue, it should be clear by now that we are not interested in monetizing via fiat. And Samurai hopes to curb the growing environment of blockchain spying. Blockchain spying has increased significantly over the past two years, and some businesses are using tracing services. If there are connections to a frowned upon activity within the transaction hop analysis, many companies may freeze your Bitcoin account. The Samurai team views this as a privacy problem for Bitcoin. Ricochet collects the inputs and minor fees needed for the transaction, and the user also pays a 0.001 PTC to Samurai to process the Ricochet transaction. Each hop transaction contains one input and one in output with the final transaction. The team explains the process does not eliminate blacklisting entirely, but fungibility is preserved by moving funds to an address out of the line site of ill-intentioned Ill actors. Since the Samurai wallet was introduced, the project was always focused on privacy and believes it's a successor to the largely abandoned Dark Wallet project. The team has added numerous features to the platform, like the ability to swipe the app off the phone from a remote location. The team considers themselves activists on a mission to provide a more fungible Bitcoin experience for users. Uh, we are privacy activists who are dedicating our lives to creating the software that Silicon Valley will never build. The regulators will never allow, the VCs will never invest in. We build the software that Bitcoin deserves, reads the Samurai developer's motto. So those who are concerned about privacy, there, there is an avenue here from Samurai Wallet uh, as a platform beyond just using um, Bitcoin mixers. Value Shuffle, a comprehensive transaction privacy for Bitcoin users. This comes from... Beep Top Web and is written by Tamir uh, Samhi. The public ledger is an indispensable part of Bitcoin's blockchain, yet it poses a serious threat that undermines the privacy of anyone sending or receiving Bitcoin. Since the source of coins can be traced and tainted, the value of two Bitcoins from two different sources might not be the same, as the coin whose source cannot be traced can be worth more than a tra traceable coin. Hence, the fungibility of Bitcoin can be questionable. To overcome these threats, many researchers have proposed a number of privacy-enhanced solutions to render Bitcoin more secure and anonymous. Nonetheless, the majority of the proposed solutions either solve only a small number of Bitcoin privacy issues, so they will provide limited value if implemented successfully, or require major modifications of the blockchain protocol. Uh, researchers for the Salard University of Germany proposed a solution to promote privacy of Bitcoin transactions. The new solution, which they named Value Shuffle, is designed on the basis of CoinJoin, a method of anonymizing Bitcoin transactions that was proposed by Gregory Maxwell. Value Shuffle is by far the first coin mixing solution to conceal the amount of coins involved in transactions, which is a proposal known as Confidential Transactions, uh, or CT. Value Shuffle is designed to guarantee the anonymity of the participants of the coin mixing round, not only against blockchain observers, but also against possible malicious attackers participating in the, mi the coin mixing round. Via coupling value shuffle with confidential transactions along with stealth addresses, the proposed solution provides what can be described as a comprehensive privacy sender's and anonymity, receiver's anonymity, and the privacy of the paid amount, without having to do any modification to the current Bitcoin protocol. The paper provided that the, combining the after I mentioned three policies <coughs> promoting strategies creates synergy that can solve the two major problems that hinder the implementation of coin mixing practices. Meaning that participants need to mix the same amount of coins and need to do so before the funds can actually be sent. 
As such, Value Shuffle can unleash the full potential of coin mixing practices as a solution of enhanced Bitcoin privacy and anonymity. So here is a much improved, you can say, protocol for uh, Bitcoin shuffling. And all Bitcoin shuffling is, kind of review of it, is you're taking several different Bitcoins at the same amount, whether it be uh, 0.5 or one whole Bitcoin. And together you guys are shifting and mixing the various amounts in between the different addresses and sending everyone back one um, Bitcoin. So that way you can't trace um, the transaction history of that Bitcoin. And so this is a, a different way of doing that, uh, using stealth addresses and CT and combining this to make this new um, type of shuffling, if you will. So it's another solution or another way of addressing the issues with uh, Bitcoin. So speaking of further problems with Bitcoin, and we'll kind of tie this all up in a bow, if you will. Bitcoin, Bitphone is closing due to regulatory requirements. Um, Bitphone was the ability for you to make payments and basically be able to get some minutes and some time on your phone and use it to pay with Bitcoin. So, Bitphone closing due to the reg regulatory requirements. After 1.5 years in operation, Bitcoin Net is shutting down. We didn't get hacked, not once. All customer funds are secure and accounted for. And we are happy to say that. Unfortunately, we've had too many users abuse our phone services. Our online line and carry service now requires we collect your identification when placing calls. We won't do it to quote uh, Roger Veer. We believe it's a reckless and ethically impermissible to extract personal private information from our users. It is not necessary for the service that they're using. Companies which capture that information expose their users by needlessly storing sensitive data in a central repository, which eventually becomes a target for hackers and other malicious actors. This is an unfortunate outcome. We have recently enhanced our service considerably. considerably. We don't want to collect your identification, so we have to choose but to close the service. This is why we can't have nice things. All accounts are now in withdrawal-only mode. You'll have until March 10th of 2017 to withdraw your funds. If you uh, rented phone numbers, please contact support for a partial refund. As demonstrated by Bitphone, uh, SideCloud is a very skilled and cloud application. To okay, so I don't need to read, read that. So well, the last bit, bit here is so long and thanks for all the bits, which is a play on the, the Douglas Adam little catchphrase by the Dolphins. And then change tip uh, shutting down. When we started change tip a little over two years ago, we had a vision for a company that would allow people to sp spread appreciation on the web for things they enjoyed. It feels good to be appreciated, and change tip aimed to make that possible all over the web. Since then, over 100,000 people have signed up for change tip, and more than 350,000 tips have been sent. We gave the Bitcoin movement a good boost, and we're honored to have been in the first Bitcoin wallet for so many people. In the spring of 2016, change tip employees were acquired by Airbnb with most of us work today. Since then, we've been searching for the best outcome for change ship, and unfortunately, the only remaining op option is to shut down. As of the end of November 2016, all tipping functionality will be deactivated, and the site will be put into withdrawal-only mode for people to collect their funds. The site will remain up for a number of months to allow users to withdraw their funds, and we will be reaching out to users to notify them. We recommend you use cha your change tip account. We can may withdraw any remaining funds via BTC withdrawal, or you can donate your funds to charity when you close your account from the settings page. So that's just, is a good thing, but also a sad thing. And it also shows the kind of the state of the, the giving process within Bitcoin. When it first came about around, people were, you know, tipping each other left and right, much like the Dogecoin community, which still does tipping. But the giving and the generosity is not quite a, what it used to be. Uh, I do think that charities still greatly benefit from direct giving by um, Bitcoin users, but on the individual peer-to-peer -peer basis, just randomly giving somebody Bitcoin, it's not quite as happening as it, as it used to be. But the plus side is that eventually Airbnb, um, which they have discussed publicly, would eventually allow for people to pay Bitcoin for their, their rentals of the various properties that are out there in the world, which is great for 
not only the Bitcoin community, but a global company like Airbnb, because they are a global company. They do reside within the Sharon County. I guess we can talk about the, the type of nature of, of whether or not you want to consider them to be a true sharing economy company, if you will, or a platform, but I guess we can save that for another discussion. But it just shows the ever-shifting nature of Bitcoin. But most importantly, there's these type of crackdowns that have been happening within the Bitcoin space. You've had, um, you've had Coinbase, um, which is a wallet and an exchange provider, being hit by the IRS to give up all its customer information. Um, so, you also have the delay of the ETF by the Wasavi, because the Facebook twins, I can never say their name, um, not quite coming online. It was supposed to happen last year, but there's been some delays. Who knows if it's going to even happen at all. Uh, you have China going off and on about what Bitcoin is with the exchanges in uh, China currently shut down. Uh, there are going to activate themselves, um, I believe it's in March, they're going to be reactivated, and then you can start um, going back on the platform um, and withdraw your Bitcoin and Litecoin, but you're going to have to give up your data to these um, exchanges as well as paying a fee. Uh, they were known for having no fees when it comes to purchasing um, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and cryptocurrencies. Um, there's other regulatory things. We talked about Venezuela. Um, concerns. Uh, India, there's some little hiccups in India, but not quite as heated as you could say China and Venezuela. And so Bitcoin, because within its eight year span, the fact that it's currently, you know, a thousand plus right now, um, it is very widely distributed. There's, while its user base is not as large as say cash or credit or checking or any other government issued platforms or corporation platforms for monetary use like Vimo or PayPal. It's out there and is ever increasing and it's not something that can be shut down. It's something that in Russia and both Russia and China have openly admitted that they can't shut it down. The United States has admitted it. That's why they put it um, in the IRS category of capital gains being property. But there are other ways to nip around it and try to contain this economic platform to prevent it from being so pervasive because if Bitcoin were ever to become massively adoptable, then it's kind of game over when it comes to government-controlled assets. Uh, Venezuela is kind of demonstrating it. India is kind of demonstrating it. All it needs is a, a use case of a country. Uh, Greece, um, Estonia, anywhere in the, in the world where if there's a strong enough use case, you're going to see greater mass adoption. It's kind of like if your friends um, are wearing shoes, but if you think it's great and it's neat, and you might consider getting the same pair of Nikes or whatever. But if you go to school and say by, you go into school on Monday, but by Friday, everyone has the pair, same pair of Nikes, then you're like going to feel like you got left out. Like you should have got those, you know, those Nikes yourself and you're going to want to participate in the, uh, in the trend. Because, you know, human beings are social animals. They want to be liked. They want to please. They want to be associated with good things and good quality things. And they want to participate in a larger community. And if you have something that's like cryptocurrency, if you have something like Bitcoin that allows for you to not only generate your own wealth, control your own wealth personally, to be able to garner and access different levels of wealth that you would not normally obtain through the traditional systems that we currently have, then you're going to want to participate. Not to, not to mention that while there is some significant animosity, particularly with the whole uh, block size debate that's still going on, and one of the reasons I kind of stopped the podcast was because it was just so negative there for a while, and it's been over a year and it still hasn't been solved, um, that there's still a, a commodity or among Bitcoin users where they want to assist, they want to help people, they want people to have control of their own personal wealth. That is still within the Bitcoin community. I think it's stronger within the Dogecoin community, personally, for myself, where people are more willing to assist and generate and and help people become a user of a crypto coin than, um, I would say, within the Bitcoin space. I think it's greater over there, which is where 
we haven't talked about Dogecoin tied in. I think even with the privacy concerns when it comes to cryptocurrencies, and even though that Zcash and Monero have come onto the market, Dash has a privacy um, feature on it. I do think that the fact that the ability to have access to the cryptocurrency, that the, the ability to have enough of it to where a lot more people are able to ha have, you know, one coin. For example, if there's only 21 million Bitcoin, if, for example, someone were to have just one coin, that means that you could say, for example, everyone's limited to one coin. That means only 21 million people could have that one coin. And say it was that one coin is worth like $100,000, you know, a transaction of wealth. That's, you know, even with the ability of Bitcoin to be um, parsed up in various pieces, that's not everyone's going to have access to that wealth, that wealth generator, if you will. Um, with Dogecoin and the built-in inflationary feature, a lot more people, given the fact that there are seven, almost 7 billion people on the, or 7 billion plus people on the planet, with Dogecoin, that's possible. Um, with Dash, to some extent, that is some possible a stronger possibility. I do have a bit of a concern with the structure of Dash with the with they have a feature called master nodes where people, you know, nodes are the, the, the feature that allows for the transactions to be processed and, and moved on, more so than the miners. They 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 basically uh, publish the ledger. Um, and now with Dash people get paid for that versus Bitcoin, you don't get paid to run a node. You don't get paid for that at all. So that's why there's not as many as there used to be. Um, right now with Dash, you have to have 10,000 um, Dash coins to create a master node, and right now one Dash is $18. That's a big buying price if you want someone to be able to control their, their wealth much better, if you will, to be, be able to make a profit. Because uh, there's a split between the miners and the master nodes as far as the um, Dash um, block reward, not to mention the transaction fees as well. So. There's a little bit of concern there. Um, Zcash and Monero have only been around less than a year now. We'll see how those things shake out. But I do think, particularly with the fact that it's taken so long for a lot of transactions on the blockchain um, to be processed on, on Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is number one, is the most widely used cryptocurrency. I think there is potential for Dogecoin to rise again, whereas some of the... Like with Ether, while Ether is more programmable money, where you're able to do other things with it and create all these different types of um, digital assets and programs, I think the, the, to get back to the basic purpose of what uh, cryptocurrency is, which is um, cash, digital cash, I think Dogecoin has the potential to rise up, as well as Litecoin, to rise up as a more feasible and, and fungible and more useful currency for the a mass adoption or for the populace. And it's just my personal thoughts on that. Then again, I'm heavily biased because I am a shibe. And the last bit of news is a new feature on here where we're going to talk about odd things that people are doing or odd bits that people are doing with blockchain. Um, the feature before was closed due to which has quite happened quite a bit within the uh, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency phase. But odd bits with blockchain. This comes from Motherboard. Weed growers are racing to register their strains on the Bitcoin blockchain. Medicinal uh, Genomics is created 23andMe for cannabis that is powered by the Bitcoin blockchain. When you walk into the dispensary in any of the 25 states where medical or recreational marijuana is legal, you're likely to see a display case lined with a dozen or more strains of weed. Many of these strains, like Pineapple Express or Blue Dreams, will sound familiar, but is the granddaddy pup you buy in Colorado the same stuff you buy from the guy in California is selling you? To answer this question, a company called uh, Medicinal uh, Genomics is creating a repository of cannabis genomes, which are stored in the block Bitcoin blockchain. The company hopes that this effect, efforts will standardize, strain, normal culture so that the customer can always know what they're getting while also defending the intellectual property rights of those who breed 
new strains of weed. So basically, this is probably one of the strongest, I would say, um, use cases of the blockchain technology, where it's being able to store information and data um, that's publicly viewable for everybody. And then you'll be able to tag and know that that particular strain, as it goes through the marketplace, is, you know, Pineapple Express or Blue Dream or uh, Granddaddy Pup. And a lot of people have been talking about this as far as, you know, antiques and paintings, um, music, DVDs, you know, authentic authenticating, authenticating the, not only the value, but that this is the item that a person is stating it is, that is actually, in fact, real, and you're not taking the uh, word, essentially the word of the person. Even if they have documentation, there's still a high, strong probability that you are still getting a faulty piece. In this case, it is a weed. I know on the Let's Talk uh, Bitcoin Network, um, on the, the crypto show, they recently just did an entire episode about this, about one of the companies are, are making an effort in this. And I highly recommend uh, listening to that show uh, because it talks about the use case for it and why it's, it's necessary and how it, you know, it protects intellectual property, whether you are for intellectual property or not, um, it is a way of doing so. If nothing else, it just validates that that particular strain is what it's supposed to be, if nothing else as far as if you're not ter terribly concerned about IP rights. So that is something that the blockchain is being used for, a little odd bit of technology is to store the DNA profiles of wheat. So that is it for the show. Um, thank you for listening. It's great to be back, and um, I look forward to hearing from you. You can reach me by via email at herojasspaceon at protonmail.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. You can always reach me at uh, Musings of the Shive on Twitter. Um, I'm also on Keybase. I have, again, I have all the social media links um, within the show notes. You can also support the show by either uh, gifting me some Bitcoin, Zcash, or Dogecoin. Or you can purchase an item through Amazon. Um, and you can use purse.io, which I'm going to do a review of Open Bazaar and Hiroja's Thought Bubble. I will also be doing my review of my experience uh, with Purse.io, which is a uh, Bitcoin company that allows you to make purchases through Amazon, via Amazon, with Bitcoin. Again, thank you for listening, and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time.